give life, you are love, you give light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Grace
Center family. It is Wednesday, our midweek service, and we are so excited that you are taking the time to join us. As you know, our renovations are taking place at the church, and so that is why we are online only, but it is exciting. Our chair installation will be complete by tomorrow, and we are thankful that during this week, we are also having our new speaker system installed as well. So we are coming back to church on Sunday in person. All of the chairs are installed, brand new seating. They are beautiful. They are comfortable. And uh, we, we are excited and grateful for what God has allowed us to do throughout these renovations. As you know, we're always constantly working on the building, constantly making upgrades. We're still finishing our baptistry as well. And areas in the foyer are going to be worked on. And we're, we're excited about all of that. And all of that is made possible 
because of you, because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness, because of your commitment. And so I just want to say thank you. I know that online service is not always easy, and often it is very awkward, um, but you all have been amazing throughout this whole process. We want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate our church family, and we miss our church family. We don't enjoy uh, not being able to see you in person, but we are excited about Sunday where we can see you in person this Sunday, 1030 a.m. and 1230 p.m. for our Spanish service. And we understand and know several will uh, be watching this live and then others are watching this later on. And so if you're not a, not a part of Revival Center family and you're joining with us tonight, right now, or later on, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We're excited about the opportunity that we have to journey through the Word of God together, where we are truly, truly grateful for that. And uh, just before we get into the Word, as a family, as a church family, there are, are needs and um, situations that others walk through, and we don't ever want them to feel like they're walking through those situations alone. And um, just before we go into the Word, we're going to have a word of prayer, and we want to remember Herb and Rachel Jenkins. We want to remember our brother and our sister, their son has passed away this past week, this week on Monday, and we want them to know that we love them, that we are praying for them, that our hearts are with them, and there is no adequate word or, or, or thoughts or ways that we can convey how we feel for them, but we want you to know that we are praying for you, Urban Rachel, we love you all. We want you and your family to know that we love you and we're praying for you. And right now, before we get into the word, I want you right where you're standing or right where you're sitting, wherever you're watching right now, would you help me pray for them and with them today? God, you see and understand and you know the loss that has taken place in their life. You understand every emotion. You are aware of every feeling and everything that is taking place but I am asking you, God, to be a peace and a comfort, a strength and the hope that you are to them, to both them and their family, their immediate family, their extended family, those that are impacted. And we are praying today that you would be that comfort that you are. We know that we're here and it's online, but we believe that you reach and you touch right where they are. And we are praying as a family together, dear God, praying for our brother and our sister today, praying that you would give them a strength that only you can give, a peace that only you bring. And we are asking, God, not only in this moment, but moving through this and this season, we are praying for them. In Jesus' name, we pray today. Thank you so very much for joining with us and believing with us together, for God to give them a strength and a peace. We know this time is not easy, but we did not want a service to go by without them knowing that we are praying for them. We are grateful for our church. We are thankful for our church family, whether it is a time of need or a time of celebration, whether it's a midweek service or a Sunday service, a Spanish service, a youth service. We are thankful that our church, we come together, we are united, we are growing, and we are thankful for that. And none of that growth takes place without the Word of God. And so we are appreciative that you would join us, that we would have this time and if you would go with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 19, 1 Kings, chapter number 19, and we're going to start with verse 19 and go through 21, and then we're going to jump to 2 Kings, chapter number 2, 12 through 14. 1 Kings 19 and 19 says this, he departed thence, talking about Elijah, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12. And Elijah passed by him, and he just cast his mantle upon him. And, talking about Elisha, after that moment, he left the oxen. He ran after Elijah and said, I pray you, I, 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 I pray you, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. Let me tell them that I'm going to follow you. And he said, go back again. What have I done to thee? And Elisha returned from him, took a yoke of oxen. He slew them and prepared them with the instruments of the oxen. And he gave it to the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He assisted 
in 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 12. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, talking about Elijah. Elijah was translated, raptured, taken. And in this moment, Elisha is looking up, and he saw him no more. He takes a hold of his own clothes, and he rents them. He tears them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said this, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted. And Elisha went over. This is a dynamic story, dynamic scriptures here as we're reading, you see the transition that is about to take place. It is the man of God, Elijah, who we talked about on Sunday. And here he is. A part of the instructions that God had given him was to go and to find Elisha. Go and find the man that would end up taking on the role of the prophet and be the one that would continue the ministry. This is something that is special. This is something that is uh, worth our time and, and worth taking notice of because Elisha does not go looking for Elijah. Elisha is found by God. He is taken notice of by God. It is God that tells Elijah, you are to go and to anoint and take a hold of and call upon and let Elisha know that I have a plan for him, that I have a work for him. And the way he goes about it is very unique. He just brushes a mantle over him. He doesn't even have a conversation. But he understands and knows that the instructions that God has given him is to go and to find Elisha. Go and find him. Let him know he's going to be next, if you would. And I feel like it's important to take notice of because we can often get lost in, God, I just want to find your purpose. God, I just want to find your perfect will. God, I just want to find what it is that you want me to do. But what we see here is a little bit reversed. What we see here and something that I think we should take notice of is that God sees us. God saw Elisha before Elisha knew, before Elisha was aware of the call upon his life, before Elisha was ever told anything, before Elisha had the opportunity to even meet Elijah, God had taken notice of where he was. It is a very simple truth, yet it is still profound. God sees you. God knows exactly where you are at. God knows exactly what's going on in your life. God knows the intentions, the, the desires, the passions that you have. God is fully aware of the things that you are active in. God is aware of the things that you have a heart and a desire for. And God sees you. It's important that we highlight this because the Bible says that Elisha found, excuse me, Elijah found Elisha. He found Elisha. Many times we are always thinking we are in the position of the search. It is us that is constantly searching. It is us. I got to find the will of God. I got to find this. I've got to find this purpose. I've got to find that. Yet it is Elijah that finds Elisha. God has him sent. Why? Because God finds you and I right where we are. He is fully aware of us. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're doing. And he cares and calls us right where we are. That's important because sometimes people will develop a mindset that says the only way God is going to call me and God is going to use me, God is going to work in my life, is if I'm able to do this first, if I'm able to do that first, if I'm able to knock on this door and open this door and have this opportunity and that opportunity open up. But God calls you and I right where we are. I want to say this to you. God calls you in the middle of what you're going through. God finds you in the middle of the struggle, 
in the middle of the success. God finds you. He is not waiting for you to do this, that, and this in order for the call to come forth. No, he has already found you. His eyes have already been upon you. He told and instructed Elijah well before Elisha even knew what was going on. There's somebody that I see. There's somebody that I've taken notice of. And I want you to be encouraged in this midweek service that God is taking notice of you. God is taking notice of you, your work, your effort, your energy, the, the activities that you're involved in, the things that you are giving yourself to. God takes full notice of. That does not mean you're perfect. That does not mean we'll ever be perfect. That does not mean we'll ever have it all together. But what that means is God finds us right where we are with what we are doing. Don't give the excuse that God can't see you. Don't give the excuse that God doesn't know what's going on. He finds us. He finds us. I want somebody to be encouraged because it does not matter what area you may have found yourself in, God finds you. It does not matter what struggle, what success you may have had, God finds you. What was he doing? What was Elisha doing? That's something that's very important. He was simply out in the field working, plowing the field with 12 yoke of oxen. There he is working. I wanna point this out because it is a truth all throughout the word of God. God finds those that are working. God finds those that are in the field. God finds those that will not remain idle. God looks for those and chooses those that are not content with having a servant do it. They were well off. The family... By, we know this because of what they had. We know this by what he is using, by the amount of oxen that he possesses. This is a family that was taken care of. This is a family, no doubt, that would have options. But rather than having a servant do the work, we find Elisha in the field working. I want to encourage somebody today because maybe you feel like you don't have any strengths. All you do is work. Maybe you feel like you don't have any talents or abilities. All you do is work in the field. You're just giving your best effort, just trying to do what you can. I want to tell you, that's what God looks for. That's what God takes a hold of. Somebody that's not waiting for somebody else to do it. Somebody that's not saying, well, let somebody else that, you know, I, I've accomplished some things in my life. I've, I've been along this journey a, 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 a while. Let somebody else take the hard work. Let somebody else do the things that are difficult. No, God looks for those people that are saying, I'm not going to remain idle. God's been good to me, but that's not a reason for me to sit on the sidelines. That's a reason for me to extend grace and mercy to somebody else. God isn't looking for those that want to sit idly by. God isn't looking to find those that don't want to be a part of the work of God. God is not looking for people that don't want to, that don't want to sweat, if you would, that don't want to give energy and effort. God is looking for people that will look for others and say, hey, what work needs to be done? Who is it that needs something in our community? Who is it that needs something in our church? Who can I help? Who, who, who can I teach a Bible study to? Who can, who can I help evangelize? Who, who can I help make a difference in their life? God looks for those that are willing to to work. People that'll call somebody else and say, hey, I, I, I know there might be a struggle going on. I just wanted to call you and encourage you. You could leave that for somebody else to do, or you can say, you know what? I'm a part of the field. I, I've come to work. I want to be a part of what God is doing. Those are the type of people that God finds, that God chooses to use. It's not glamorous. Who wants to be in the field with a bunch of oxen? Who, who wants to be sweating and working? And who, who wants to do that when you can have the opportunity to sit idly by? but yet those are the people that God takes notice of. Those are the people where it would be easy. Maybe you've been in church a long time and it would be easy for you to sit by and say, hey, I've done everything that I could do for God. No, no, no. God is looking for people that said, hey, the work of God is never done. There's always somebody that's looking for salvation. There's always somebody that's looking to be baptized and looking for grace and looking for mercy. There's always somebody, there's always a family that may be in need. There's always some work that needs to be done. God is looking to choose and take a hold of those people that are not wanting to sit idly by, but saying, hey, 
I want to be in the field. I want to be working for the kingdom of God. I want to be making a difference in somebody's life. He would be set. Elisha would be set. He could stay on the farm. He's comfortable with the tools. He's comfortable with the animals. He's comfortable with the income. He's comfortable with everything that he has to his life. But the call of God came forth and it found him right where he is. Will we answer the call of God? Will we take a hold of it? It's not special. It's just him working. And that is what gets the attention. That is what God is looking for. And that's what God is taking notice of. And he sends Elijah to him. And Elijah just kind of brushes that mantle over him. There, It's almost rude. You just walk by. You don't even say hi. You don't even say anything. You just walk by. Can you imagine somebody just walk by you and just kind of throw a coat on you? You're like, excuse me, what do you think you're doing? But yet it wasn't that case. That wasn't the case here. This moment passes and Elisha recognizes how special it is. And he recognizes what is happening right now, that God is actually calling me, that God is, is telling me that there's more. And without hesitation, it's there in that moment. The Bible says that he left the oxen. We know out of respect to his family, he goes back and he tells his family goodbye. He, he prepares a meal for the people there, almost as a thank you and appreciation. Thank you for everything you've done in my life. Thank you for the opportunity. However, I'm leaving. The Bible says he left the oxen. The call of God will always require us to leave things behind. Things of comfort, things of power, things of ease, things that are opportunities for us, things that would make things more convenient. This is his area. This is what he's used to. This is what he's known all his life. This is what he's comfortable with. But he left the oxen. He left the income. He left what he had known for so long. I'm saying this to someone here today because I want you to be encouraged that that call of God, when you feel that he's requiring more and he's asking more of you, and you, but I've got to leave this behind, but I've got to let that go. That is a part of the call of God on your life. You cannot take everything with you. Where God is wanting to take you, there are things that you are going to have to leave behind. I know sometimes it won't make sense. I know it's not going to be easy, but there are things that we have to leave behind because we are being obedient to the call of God. But what I have can help provide, but what I have could make a difference somewhere down the way. God is saying, I am calling you. I'm the one that's going to be your source. I'm the one that's going to be the difference in your life. I'm the one that will guide you. I'm the one that will direct you. I'm the one that will sustain and provide for you. There are things that have to be left behind. I want to encourage you with that because there's some things that maybe you have left behind and you're wondering, was it worth it? Should I have done that? Is, was that the right call? When you are answering the call of God and you are leaving those things behind and you are letting go of those things, that does not mean that life gets easier. That does not mean that life is more comfortable. Often, it's the opposite. There's more difficulty. There's a little bit more struggle. There's more question marks, if you would. But when you're obedient to the call of God, those things that you left behind are left behind because he knows they're not needed for where you are going. He knows that there are certain things that he's going to allow you to let go because where he's taking you, you are not going to have need of those things. I, I feel to encourage somebody with that because it's important where I'm going and what God is doing in my life. It's not always going to be evident. God doesn't always give you the plan. He doesn't always give you the blueprint. He's not going to give you the instruction manual and say, okay, this is where it starts and this is where it ends. It doesn't work that way. So during this process, there's going to be difficulty, but... If you needed it, he would have had you take it with you. But those things that you leave behind are because you don't need them for where you are going. 
sacrifices that you make unto God, he always takes notice of. He always takes notice of. And I know we would love to say, hey, God will pay you back in this area and that area and this area. God doesn't have to pay you back. God isn't telling you, yes, you do this and I'm going to pay you back in this way or that way. No, I'm answering the call of God. I'm answering the call of God. I don't know where it's going to lead. I, I, Elisha isn't leaving his oxen and God saying, all right, because you left that 12 yoke of oxen, I'm going to give you 24 yoke of oxen. No, you're leaving behind things you don't need because you're answering the call of God and the call of God is going to take you in the places, in the areas of life that you never thought would be possible. You don't need those things. And that's where the call of God is pulling you. And that's where he's guiding you and directing you. And here's what happens. It's not even special. It just says that he goes and he makes this meal for his family and he says bye and he goes and ministers unto Elijah. He doesn't get a special badge. There is no ceremony for Elisha. There is no one there talking about a going away party, telling him how amazing he is. There's nobody there to welcome him. No, he's just following the dirt and the dust that Elijah is leaving. He is walking with him. He is serving him. He is giving him water. You don't hear about Elisha until 2 Kings chapter number 2. Here, right now in 1 Kings 20, 19, excuse me, the end of 19, he, he answers the call of God, he leaves things behind, and he is there just, the Bible says, to minister unto him. He, is, he makes this sacrifice. Why did you sacrifice? Why did you answer the call of God in your life? To serve. That's it. I answered this call. I left behind everything that I had. And I am answering this call. What are you doing, Elisha? I'm ministering unto him. Silence. No attention. No fanfare. No pats on the back. Nobody telling him how amazing he is. Just complete silence until 2 Kings chapter number 2. It is in the silence that there is growth that is happening. It is in the times that he is serving that we do not see, that we do not know, that God is allowing there to be growth in our life in the silence. I want to say this to you today. When you don't feel the attention of anybody else, when you don't have the attention of anybody else, when nobody else is not there to encourage you, when nobody else is there to lift you up and nobody else is there to say, hey, your sacrifice is worth it and what you did is amazing, when nobody else is there to do that, will you continue to serve? Because it is in those moments that there is growth and development happening in your life. As it is silent, as it is quiet faithfulness, as he's giving the man of God water, as he's following him everywhere he goes, as he's doing whatever task and daily task was necessary, as he's setting up the tent and he's tearing it down, as he's moving the location and carrying supplies over and over and over and over again, there was growth and development that was happening. And here we see it in 2 Kings chapter number 2. Elijah is about to be taken. God is about to take him away. God is about to rapture him, and he knows he's about to be taken. And he tells Elisha, what, what is it that you want with me? What would you have from me? He says, I pray for a double portion. And Elisha says, all right, well, I, you know, that's more than I have, but if you're here when God takes me, it'll be given to you. It, it can only come from God. And it is here. We don't hear from him between the time that he sacrificed and the time that he is here. It is just silent. It is just quiet, but obvious growth and development had been taking place in his quiet faithfulness where nobody else can see. And I want to encourage you right now before we move forward, and I won't be much longer, but in your quiet faithfulness, allow there to be growth and development that takes place. Don't let it be complaints. Don't let it be anger. Don't let it be bitterness. Don't, 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 don't let it be negative thinking. Don't let it be cynical thoughts. Let, let it be growth and development through the silent 
times of our life, God, through the process that you are taking us through, which I don't understand. I left everything and I'm ministering under the man of God. I left everything and here I am uh, just serving him, getting him water and whatever it is that he needs. Why did you call me here? I'm not exactly sure what you have in my life. I haven't done a miracle yet. Nobody's asked to hear me speak. Nobody's coming to me for healing. Why and what are you doing in my life? I do not understand. However, in this quiet time, I'm going to be faithful. In this quiet time, I'm going to serve. In this quiet time, I'm going to give to the best of my ability. I'm going to do all that I can. And God honors that because as we see in 2 Kings chapter number 2, as Elijah is taken away, that mantle falls down and it falls to the ground. And Elisha is there and he's obviously mourning. He's obviously sad for what has happened. But the Bible says that he takes a hold of of his own clothes, and he rips them in two pieces, and he tears those apart, and he goes to grab that mantle. Before the newness of life, before there are things that we grow into, there are some things that we tear apart. There are some things that we rip away. There are some things that we remove from us. Why? Because there are some things that we are never going back to. Elisha was saying in that moment, if you would, I'm tearing away of what I have present. I'm sad, I'm mourning, but also this is going to indicate that I am moving forward in the next season of my life. What was is no longer. I am tearing this away and I am taking a hold of the new. I'm taking a hold of that mantle. I'm taking a hold of some things that I'm going to have to grow into. I'm taking a hold of some things that do not yet fit me, but I am going to grow in to. We never stop growing. We never stop learning. We never stop applying. We never graduate to where there's no more of God. No, right now, maybe in this season of your life, maybe as you're listening to, to this right now, it's important that you're reminded there are some things that we got to tear away, some things that we got to let go of and never go back to. We never want to put on those things again. Why? Because there's a newness. There is a development. There is something that God is doing in my life, and I am ready for that, and I am taking a hold of it. And he takes a hold of that mantle, and he, and he drapes it over himself, if you would. And the Bible says this, that he makes his way back to Jordan. Elijah had put that mantle to the, to, to the waters. He smote the waters and the Jordan River separated and they both went across. Now Elijah is gone and Elisha has that mantle and he steps to that river and he takes that mantle and he smites the waters and he says, where is the God of Elijah? It is important that each and every one of us have our own experiences with God. Whether you're the youngest one listening to this or you're the most seasoned saint, it's important that we have our own experiences with God. It's not enough to just see it. It's not enough to just hear it. It's not enough just to know of it. We have to experience it for ourselves. The God of Elijah is the God of Elisha. The God of your mother, your father, the God of your pastor, the God of your bishop, that is your God as well. It has to be a personal experience. And what we see, Elijah's last miracle was smiting the waters of the Jordan River. And Elisha's first miracle was smiting the waters of the Jordan River. God is going to be with you. When you answer his call, when you are active in what he has called you to do and what he has positioned you for, I am telling you today, God will always, always work in your life. He looks and says, where is the God of Elijah? And God is saying to him, I'm your God. I am your God. I am the God of Elisha. I am the God that will make a move for you. I am the God that will provide for you. I am the God that will be with you. And I am telling the wonderful people of Revival Center, he is your God. He is the God that will work on your behalf. He is the God that will answer. He is the God that will do things that only he can do. He is the God that has called you unto himself for what he desires to do. We won't always see it. We, will always, we won't always know it. We won't always understand everything that God is doing. 
But when we answer the call and we're serving and we're faithful even in silence, those are areas and times where God is growing and developing and God is not finished. God is continuing what he did before in the other generations. God is ready to do again and in a new way for you, for your family, for our church. And we are grateful. We are grateful that when we answer the call of God, it will take us It will guide us. It will direct us according to his plan. And we are thankful today right here on a midweek service that we are reminded that God's hand, that God's call is upon our life and he desires for the work of God to continue. It didn't end with Elijah. It continued with Elisha and it continues in you and me today. And I want to pray with you right now, right where you are, God. You see us, you know us, you understand. You know, God, where we all are, different parts of the journey, God. And we're reminded today, there's some things we leave behind to answer your call. There's some things we take a hold of. There's some things, dear God, that you are doing that we will not understand, but it is you that has found us. It is you that has highlighted us. It is you, dear God, that has taken a hold of right where we are in the middle of everything that is going on in our lives. You highlight it and you take a hold of us and you work in a way that only you can. And today, God, we are encouraged. Today, God, we remind you that we desire your work, that we desire your will, that we want to work for your kingdom. We want to make a difference in the lives of others by your power. And God, today we pray your favor, we pray your anointing, and we pray your blessing upon Revival Center. In Jesus' name. We pray. May the Lord be with you. I pray that this has been an encouragement to you and a strength to you. And we cannot wait to worship with you Sunday, 1030 a.m. in person. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, you found me. You healed me. You called me from the grave. You gave me your ring. I thank you, Jesus, you washed my sins away, and now I'm living like I'm forgiven, you came and set me free, that's what your mercy did for me, Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from Thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. And now I'm living like I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. And every morning. What your mercy did for me. Thank you, Lord. That's what your mercy did for me. For you, yes, it did. That's what your mercy did for me.